The Gates of Hell is an unofficial trilogy of horror films by Italian genre director Lucio Fulci, consisting of City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, and House by the Cemetery. It's one of those thematic trilogies where these are three separate, unrelated stories, but they each have to do with a portal to hell, and are driven more by themes, imagery, and nightmare logic than a traditional plot. They also all have zombies in them of some kind, all-star actress Catriona McCall in different roles, and they all end on kind of a downer to varying degrees. Although only one of these films is truly great in my personal opinion, they all have a nice mixture of gore, atmosphere, and the right amount of silliness, but I still find them all entertaining for what they are. So in this video, I'm going to go over all three films and give some of my thoughts. First up is City of the Living Dead, released in 1980. During a seance in New York, a psychic has a vision of a creepy priest who hangs himself in Dunwich, Massachusetts, and somehow opens up a gateway to hell, and if it isn't closed by All Saints Day, the dead will rise up all around the earth. This movie establishes the Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith influences on these stories with the town of Dunwich, which is featured in Lovecraft's novella The Dunwich Horror. Although it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the story of the novel from what I can tell. City is my second favorite in the trilogy. It's not as strong as the next entry and it definitely has some issues, but there's a lot I enjoy and admire about it. I rewatched it once near Halloween last year and it felt like the perfect movie for the season. Not only because it takes place on Halloween, but it has this great spooky aura to it. The plot is pretty loose, bordering on meandering, and it's a little too talky, which does lead to some pacing issues at times. However, I think it compensates for some of these flaws with its strong visuals and atmosphere, gore set pieces, and musical score. Speaking of the music, this is the first of the two films in the trilogy with a musical score composed by frequent Fulci collaborator Fabio Frizzi. Even though it pales in comparison to the next entry in the series, I still really enjoy it and it adds a lot to the atmosphere of the film. Even if you're not familiar with Fabio Frizzi's work, if you've watched Kill Bill Volume 1, you've heard some of his music. As the song that plays during the hospital scene is actually the main theme from another Fulci film called The Psychic or Seven Notes in Black. I also really like the cinematography here. My favorite shot in the movie is the scene where the character Mary is trapped in a coffin, and the lighting makes her face look kind of like a skull. It's one of those things that makes no logical sense, but it looks really cool, so who cares? My favorite part of the movie, though, is probably the handful of extremely memorable kills and gross-out sequences, two of them being among my favorite horror movie death scenes of all time, and they are the highlights of the film. The first one, the character Bob, is killed by a table drill through the head, which in typical Italian splatter fashion goes on just short of forever, and the second is the apparition of the evil priest appears and stands there menacingly staring at a young woman until her eyes start to bleed and she literally starts puking her guts out. And again, it goes on for a comically long time. And I'm not normally grossed out by bugs, but let me tell you how they filmed this maggot scene. Apparently, they put like 20 pounds of real live maggots through an industrial fan or two, and watching these actors get absolutely pelted knowing the maggots are all real and seeing them shake them out of their hair and stuff is really nasty. And apparently the cast later played a prank on Fulci by filling his tobacco pipe with the maggots as well. So yeah, these two kills are extremely awesome, but if I have anything to say about the rest of the film, as far as kills go, they do reuse the grabbing someone's head and squishing their brains out effect pretty often. And as I mentioned before, there are zombies, and they're similar to more traditional zombies, but there's a, they're a lot more supernatural, almost like they're crossed with ghouls or demons or something. My biggest issues with the film come from the third act and the ending. The climax of the film in general is pretty underwhelming. The gang basically just go to Dunwich, fart around in the crypt a little bit, find the zombie priest guy, stab him. He goes on fire for some reason, and it's over, except maybe it isn't. Yeah, the ending is really weird and abrupt. I read that the film for this scene was damaged somehow and they couldn't do reshoots, which kind of explains it. I read a couple different stories about how the film got damaged, with one story be literally being a cup of coffee spilled on it, but I'm not sure if any of them are 100% confirmed. I've also heard it said that Fulci just didn't like the original ending they shot and scrapped it, so you can choose your own adventure when it comes to what the hell happened here. As for what the ending was supposed to be, uh, based on what we see, I assume the kid at the end was either going to turn into a zombie or get grabbed by a zombie at the last minute. 
Overall, it's not as great as the next film I'll be talking about, but I still think it's a fun movie and good for a spooky vibe. And the second film in the trilogy, the one I'm most excited to talk about because it's also one of my favorites, The Beyond, released in 1981. I just bought us some new sheets at Bed Bath & Beyond. Oh boy, I hope you stayed away from that Beyond section. In the Beyond, a woman inherits an old hotel in Louisiana, and after a series of weird supernatural incidents, we find out that it was built on one of the seven gateways to hell. The Beyond feels like a series of set pieces and images connected by a loose plot, and it handles that kind of storytelling the best of the three in my opinion. It does not waste time with a bunch of bullshit. We get this awesome prologue of this warlock dude being lynched by an angry mob, flash forward, lady inherits hotel, there's like 60 seconds max of exposition, and creepy shit starts happening immediately, which I love. Not that I don't enjoy a good slow burn, but I also appreciate a movie that knows what we're here for and delivers on it. The Beyond is a film in which a man is mauled by tarantulas for no discernible reason other than it's freaky, and you're either with that kind of thing or you're not, and I am very much with it. Speaking of this scene, he could have just fell off the ladder and hit his head or broke his neck and died and literally nothing about the rest of the film would need to be changed. But they decided to have a swarm of tarantulas appear out of nowhere and start eating his face, which is fucking awesome. I love this movie. Fun fact, while tarantulas are mostly harmless to human, it's the ones that look like Halloween decorations that you really need to watch out for, because they will get you. On paper, the storyline is really basic, which is why I think a more straightforward approach without Fulci's direction and Sergio Salvati's cinematography would have been much less memorable, or fun to watch. The visual direction of the trilogy is at its peak here, and even outside of the gore set pieces and crazier shit that happens, it's just filled with extremely memorable and compelling images and scenes. While some of the interior scenes were filmed in Rome, much of the film was shot on location in Louisiana, and it makes really good use of its setting with the scene of Liz running into Emily on the highway bridge being one of the best examples. It gives the movie a nice southern gothic mood without overemphasizing it to the point where it feels gimmicky. The interior scenes are also well shot and visually pleasing, and I like the lighting during the scene when Emily explains the hotel's history to Liza in particular. And I can't talk about this movie without talking about the musical score also by Fabio Frizzi, which is incredible. And probably one of my favorite horror movie scores ever. The apocalyptic Latin chanting of Wachi Dal Nula is really cool. <laughs> and I also love this theme that plays during some of the more intense scenes. And this recurring theme that we can hear being played on the piano by Emily. Side note, I was fortunate enough to catch a screening of the new composer's cut of the Beyond back in November, which is not only a 4K restoration of the original film, but features a re-recorded musical score from Fabio Frizzi. I want to hold off on making a detailed review or comparison of it until the disc version is released and I can watch both versions back to back. As I mentioned in my review, The Beyond is already a great looking film, but the new 4K restoration really makes the little details and colors and things like that pop. So even if you're not crazy about the idea of reworking the score, I think it's worth checking out if there's a screening in your area, if only to see the new restoration on the big screen. As for the score itself, it's pretty similar to the original from what I can tell, it just features a more modern quality sound, and the choral parts use an actual choir instead of the electronic instrument the original used, which was really cool to hear. If you've seen clips of Frizzy's live shows where he performs music from the movie, it sounds a lot like that. I think there's a vinyl version of the new score available to purchase if you're interested in hearing it, and I hope they release a digital version at some point or include a copy with the Blu-ray. Also, speaking of the music, I have to point out the greatest scene transition of all time. <gasps> Ah! 
Like City, this film features a prominent reference to Lovecraftian lore in the Book of Avon, which was created by author Clark Ashton Smith and appeared in his short The Door to Saturn, as well as other stories. However, the sigil associated with Avon in the film came from a design that one of Lucio Fulci's teenage daughters gave herself as a stick and poke tattoo that the director hated, which I think is hilarious. I always just assumed it was some kind of occult symbol until I found that out. And I wonder how many Fulci fans have subsequently gotten the same tattoo design as well. The Beyond also has one of my favorite endings to a horror movie as well, which I feel delivers on the apocalyptic scenario suggested in City. The visuals used to depict hell, purgatory, or whatever this is are simple but still unique and memorable. The scene was actually filmed in a studio with black walls and soil covering the floor, which the crew would moisten with water the day before filming, and the heat of the studio lights would turn it into vapor which gives it the foggy, dreamlike look. The bodies on the floor are allegedly street folks who were paid in alcohol for their participation. In conclusion, The Beyond is a fucking masterpiece, and I consider it a must-watch if you're into horror and have a certain tolerance for visual storytelling over plot. And finally, House by the Cemetery, also released in 1981. In the final entry of this trilogy, a family moves to a secluded home in New England, which unbeknownst to them was once the home of mad scientist Dr. Freudstein. Meanwhile, their young son has been communicating with the ghost girl who previously lived in the house and begins to notice strange things happening, particularly in the basement. This is definitely the weakest point in the trilogy. I'm not as negative towards it as some others, but it is kind of slow paced and has the most simplistic narrative. It also features a poorly dubbed child actor very prominently, which always loses points with me. I'm gonna be sounding like a broken record a lot when I'm talking about this movie because practically everything I have to say about it starts with, well, it's not as good as the other two, but it's okay. I think the story is fine, if not that unique, although I suppose you could say that about any of these. And I did like the ending a lot. Not nearly as much as The Beyond, obviously, but more than City because of the fact that it has one. I think combining aspects of a gory slasher flick and a more traditional ghost story is kind of an interesting creative choice. And the film handles it pretty well. There's some clear inspiration here from The Turning of the Screw and The Shining, all of them being ghost stories involving children, and the setup of the family moving to a cursed home due to the father's work and their son being perceptive to the paranormal reminded me a lot of The Shining. The film does look good, and I like the camera work and abundance of zooms, but outside a couple of things, it's not nearly as interesting as the other two films, and there's not as many visuals that stick with me after the movie's over. Many of Fulci's films focus on the eyes, not only in the creative ways he can destroy them, but just in the cinematography there's so many extreme close-ups and emphasis on the actor's eyes. Which I generally really like, although it's overused a couple points here to the point of being comical, especially when it comes to the Anne character. It doesn't lean quite as much into surrealism, but it does have some cool moments like the opening knife through the head kill and weirder stuff like the beheaded mannequin that foreshadows a later character death. I also love the goofy-ass bat toy attack, the scene where the nanny is being brutally murdered and Bob takes his sweet time grabbing his stuffed animal and pink toy gun to go save her, and the scene where Bob is trapped in the basement with Freudstein who is holding his face to the door while his father is trying to break it down with an axe, kind of like the coffin scene in City. And I think it makes a little more sense here because there's a lot more urgency to the situation. Like, looking at the scene in City, it's like, there's probably a way to open that without almost caving her skull in. Speaking of good old Dr. Freudstein, the design itself is, it's kind of basic, but I still think the mask is kind of cool. And I enjoy the scenes and how they built up to the reveal, even though at the end of the day, he's a pretty standard non-speaking monster or slasher villain. I also like the musical score, which again, isn't as memorable as Frizzy's work, but Walter Rosati does a fine job. I like the main theme that plays over the opening credits in particular. Like I said, it's not a bad movie and there are elements I enjoy, but it is noticeably a step down from the other two and I don't feel the need to rewatch this as much. I think it's worth checking out if you're a Fulci completionist or you just like campy 80s horror movies in general, but it's definitely not the main course here. So that was Lucio Fulci's Gates of Hell trilogy. Starts off pretty good, has an amazing middle entry, and ends okay. But I enjoyed revisiting these films, particularly City and Cemetery as they were less fresh in my memory. 
I'd like to hear your thoughts below, and if you're interested in future content from me, please consider hitting that subscribe button. This was Taylor from Discomfort Films. Thank you, have a wonderful day, and watch out for tarantulas and zombies.